Well, good to see you and good to be uh, with you here in church and be doing church with you right now. I just got back from, from camp, so if I look more disheveled than usual, um, it's because I rushed here from camp. Had a blast the, the last few days. Last night I was, till very late at night, was sitting out by uh, at a fire with, with Hayden and a bunch of other people, about 20 other people, just hanging out and talking about life and marriage and family and kids and, and all of that. And just a, a great weekend. We talked about... Um, it's family camp, and so you know we talked about you know how to balance family and life and work and conflict in the home. Just really, really good stuff. I had a, a few buddies come to me and just say, "Man, this weekend was like huge for my own marriage and our own family." And just just love seeing uh, growth like that within within families um, at, at our church. But I had so much of a blast that today I was sitting around a fire and I was like, "Oh, I, I gotta preach," and so I jumped in jumped in the truck and. Uh, raced here, made it in time, and I'm I'm glad I did. Glad I could be with you. Uh, last summer we had a bridge. We had a bridge team down in Honduras with with just one doing some construction on like a, a school building. And I've done construction before, like in college. They helped me get through college, but never this kind of construction. And so for the first couple of days, all I did was swing a pickaxe. Learned how old I was. Swinging a pickaxe in, in the sun. Like we would load the cars up after, you know, after like the shift to, to go to dinner. I'd fall asleep on the way to, to dinner. Now, luckily, Maddie is like our, our what's happening. You know, girl just did the, the what's happening. Uh, she's a brutal boss, by the way. Girl had me on like a chain gang the whole week. I, I, so I grew up with her. I consider her a sister. And she's just ruthless with me. But somehow she found it in her heart. Some, some mercy for me, and she gave me a break, and she rotated me to, to another crew, to another job, to tying rebar. My team, my rebar team, was a few hundred guys who didn't speak English, and then me, the gringo. Now, I only know un poquito espanol from high school, and all I cared to learn or at least remember in Spanish was how to insult somebody and how to pick up a girl. It's, it's, my, mi espanol is just is malo. It's, it's useless. It's, it's from high school. And so these construction workers are, are, you know, they're showing me how to tie rebar. We can barely communicate with each other. So we're playing this game of charades that they're showing me. And periodically, a, an interpreter kind of jump in and, and help out. And so we got to this point. I was like, all right, I think I got it. So I get to work, and I have my, my own little station out in the middle of the dirt lot. I'm tying rebar for hours, tying, tying rebar, sweating it out in the beautiful Honduran sun. I don't want to brag, but I made some pristine pillar cages. Like they were, they were level, they were symmetrical, they were sturdy. Like forget Michelangelo, hang my rebar pillars in the Sistine Chapel. Like they were works of art. Like pastor gig doesn't work out, I'm going to go tie rebar. So hours later, you know, I'm pretty proud. Hours later, I'm finishing up, I call the foreman over. I was like, hey, yo soy un artista, eh? You know, gringo the man, eh? And foreman started laughing. He's like, ah, gringo es tanto. Like, Tonto? S- silly? I'm not a Tonto. What are we talking about, Tonto? Apparently, I was supposed to construct the footing for the pillar before the pillar. Now, that got lost somewhere in translation. So the, all the teams are laughing at me. You know, I started mumbling under my, you know, my Spanish under my breath. You know, I'm a Tonto. Tú es Tonto. You know, a burro sabe más que tú. A donkey knows more than you. you know? so, so I said, okay, okay listen, guys, I, I'll just add the, the footings. Like, we'll just add the footings to the pillars. Problem solved. NBD. Don't need to make fun of me. They said, gringo, you tied the pillars so tight, we can't maneuver them to fit them on the footings. Your beautiful pile of art is completely useless. And suddenly that pickaxe started looking real good. So I spent the next hour just clipping rebar joints to start all over. It was the worst. Like that day's sunburn and calluses were, were all for nothing because I didn't have the right order. And when you don't have the right order, you end up with a useless mess at the end. Regardless of how hard you worked and how great it looked. And I fear that many of us are doing that with our lives. Priorities are jacked up, out of order. Oh, you're working hard. And you're, you're building a life that looks good. You have this wonderful career. You have this beautiful family. You're tying everything down beautifully. But in the end, life's done. And your name gets called and you stand before the boss. What will your decades of building, what will it matter? Have you been doing life out of order? And what you've built this last week, will it matter in eternity? It's what you built this last week. 
it will be all for nothing. I mean, how many people will reach the end of their lives and say, I spent years building something that is useless? It's a lot of people. It's most people. It's why an old prophet named Haggai wrote an ancient blog, and he's up to bat today. So we're going to be in the book of Haggai chapter 1. It's page 791 in the Bibles in the chairs, but Haggai chapter 1. We've been in this series called The Minor Prophets, looking at these, these 12 obscure books right at the end of the Old Testament that a lot of people just kind of skip over because they're often confusing. Um, there's difficult you know, history that you, that's tied up and prophecy. It's, they're, they're not easy books to read, and so a lot of people skip right over them. But as a church this summer, we've just decided we're going to jump right into it, and it has been a blast, and Haggai is up to bat today. We have a one-point, if you look at your notes, we have a one-point sermon today, which is kind of fun. Less note-taking. Haggai chapter one. Weird name, right? Haggai or Haggai. People say it very differently. In the, in the circle that I grew up in, they called him Haggai when I was a little kid. That's how I always heard it, Haggai. And then when I went to Bible college, my Bible professor would say Haggai. So in college, I was like, well, I don't want to sound like an idiot. So I tried to like switch how I would say the name. Then I went to grad school, and my professors in grad school called him Haggai. So it's like, I, I'm, you know, it's been back and forth. You're probably going to hear me say it both ways. But the truth is, we, the, both pronunciations are probably wrong. I think the Hebrew pronunciation is more like the, you know, get the... The, the, the back of the throat, you know, going, the Haggai, and I'm not going to try to do that at, at all. Um, but Haggai is just a, a, weird, a weird name to us, and so people kind of give up on him, right? It's like, I can't even read or say your name, bro. I'm not going to read your blog. But today we're pushing past that. We're going to get to know Haggai better, and as we do, we're going to so- find something very, very convicting, uh, yet very, very powerful, and I hope you're up for it. If not, it's too late anyways, you're in here. It's raining outside, where are you going to go? So we're going to read this. If you're online, listen, we know if you sign off, and we're going to send someone to your house. We, we don't really know. I don't think we know. But anyways, we're going to be in Haggai chapter 1. Let me pray, and we'll just jump right into this. God, we do thank you for your word. And even when your word can feel confusing at times or hard to understand, your word is still living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we ask that you do a surgery on us today with that sword, because we need it. Ask that none of us fight off conviction, but that we come before you humbly, submitting ourselves to what you say. Father, please speak to us, for we are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the lens of Scripture zooms in to Haggai chapter 1, we find ourselves in Jerusalem. Rays of sunlight peek through the scattered clouds, peppering shadows on the green valley below. And kids run freely down the steep hill into the brook to cool off in the refreshing water of the Kidron Valley. Teams of men build scaffolding around the city walls to repair some crumbled bricks. And women sweep out brush out of old wine presses before they begin to stomp grapes. See, last year, Jerusalem was pretty much a ghost town. It was depressed and it was empty. Today, it's a straight party. It's a day that the inhabitants know that they'll one day attempt to try to describe to their grandchildren. But words just won't be able to paint the feeling that hangs in the air in this mountain city today. It's high emotions. Yet at the same time, it's mixed emotions. I mean, there's the elation, of course. An overwhelming excitement, this bubbling joy throughout the city. Because for 70 years, the Jews were held in captivity far from Jerusalem. And for seven decades, they just yearned and longed to return back to Jerusalem. For generations, they had been told by their parents about the city of Jerusalem, the specialness of the city, the history of the city going back to King David, the city where God dwelt with his people, the great temple, the beautiful Kidron Valley. Like there is nothing like Jerusalem. And yet there they are in the city that their parents told them about, free from captivity, back in the city of their ancestors. Each day they awake, it's like they have to pinch themselves. And yet there's also stress. 
The city is in complete disrepair. Houses are burnt, many of them are leveled. There's confusion over who lives where, who gets what. The market is bare. There's an economy to reboot. They're extremely vulnerable, so there's the threat of attack. There's crops to plant, there's posts to fill. There's an army to recruit. There's businesses to start. It's all extremely overwhelming, and the shock will not soon wear off. And so they get to work. They're tying rebar, so to speak. They're planting their crops. They're repairing their homes. But it's all out of order. Verse 1, you ready? It says this, Haggai 1, verse 1. If you look at your Bibles, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Isn't that so good? It's good stuff right there. We could just end it right there, right? So inspiring there, verse 1. No, it, so it's actually a very important verse because it gives us context, and context is very important as we study Scripture. This is not a made-up story. This happened. There's dates and there's biblical, biblical names that, that all align here. But I want to point out that Haggai writes in the sixth month, which is the Hebrew month Elul, which is September, and Haggai writes it's the first day of the month. So you think about like the first day of September. Now, that's not just a random day, like, oh, the first day of the month. The Jews during this time saw the first day of the month as a holy day where they would worship on that day. Whether it was Sabbath, a day of worship or not, if it was the first day of the month, we, we worship on that day. And this comes from the idea that we give our first, our first fruits, so our, our, our first of the harvest, but also our first day of the week, our first day of the month. It all goes, the, the best goes to God. And so the first day of the month was given to God. I like that. It's too bad that we've, we've lost that over the years. But the first day of the month, it goes to God. And so Haggai is, is setting the scene here. He's saying, okay, it's fall. You know, Jerusalem is starting to feel a little bit, just a little bit of the temperature relief, a little bit of the drops in the evening. It's many people's favorite time of year. It's the first day of, of, of the month. And so there's this, this worshipful atmosphere. And Haggai has a message from God. This is God speaking to the people in Jerusalem. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time is, has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So God says, all right, I see you all busy. Let me just get this straight. I free you. I give you a new life. I bless you. I give you this city. And instead of that blessing causing you to worship and to build my house, you receive my blessing with stress and you focus on your to-do list. It's a slap in the face. And yet I've done the same thing. And I bet you have too. I see it all the time, and I see it all the time in my own life. It's like, hey, I'll get to God. I'll get to serving, but now's not the time. You know, it's sports season, and God has blessed us with this opportunity and money to be able to enjoy sports, and so I just can't serve or be in church right now. Now's not the time. Or, hey, we, you know, we just had a baby, and uh, we're just gonna focus on nesting and, and building the home. You know, serving, being in church, pursuing God, that's just gonna have to go on the back burner. Now, I'm not saying it's like you, you have to serve the day after having a baby, but some people, it's, it's months, it's years, or it, sometimes it's never. You know, now's not the time. God blessed me with this baby, and so I'm gonna use that baby, the blessing from God, as an excuse to not serve or not pursue him. I, I see this with uh, couples who are dating. They're often very involved in church as soon as they get married. It's like, we're done. So we receive this blessing from God, this marriage, and I'm going to use that blessing to keep me. Or, hey, I just got this new job, you know, this new position going. I got to learn the ropes. And so I need to step back from church and serving because God blessed me with this job. And so now's not the time really to serve. I'm going to take this blessing from God and I'm going to use it as an excuse to not pursue him. And we don't do this intentionally, but you think about it. We take this gift from God. What is it from you? Maybe it's an opportunity, a baby, a new job, and we use that very gift as an excuse to not serve him. This is Israel right here. God gives this massive blessing, freedom, a city, and Israel takes the gift and says, thanks. Now, because we have this, we've got a lot to do. Now's not the time to build your house. We have to build our house first. Let us get our stuff done first. Then we'll think about your stuff. They're tying rebar out of order. Like, I imagine these people, and, and they probably have good hearts, right? They wake up early in the morning. They're putting in 12 to 14-hour days to, to repair. They're working hard. They're building their homes. They're rebooting the economy. There's long hours of hard work. And God's saying, it's all for nothing, though. And God, in his grace, he steps in. He says, wait. Start with my house. 
Because my dwelling, my house, the temple is the foundation of your community and your life. Don't do anything without the foundation first. And I wonder if God might be saying something similar to you. Verse three, it says, Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. He said, actually, I pull verse four up here. It says, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? You notice the sarcasm here? I'm kind of surprised. Like, God, sarcastic? It kind of looks like it to me right here. The phrase paneled houses is, is the giveaway. Paneled houses were artistic, they were ornate homes. See, most homes during this time were like just simple stone and stone and mortar homes. The average home had very little to no decor. There was nothing ornate about a typical home. It was just very impractical to be artistic with your home. It's just stone and mortar. Apparently in Jerusalem, though, people were streaming HGTV because they were getting like really, really into, you know, into design. And that in and of itself is not wrong. Like I love artistic flares in homes. I love, like for me personally, I love finding industrial antiques and putting them in our home. My wife makes fun of me because I like atmosphere and I like deco. She's the organizer and I'm out buying like lights and art. Decorating isn't like wrong. The point that God is making here is here you are, you're spending so much time and so much money on making your homes look super, super nice. You got these competition, you know, you're keeping up with the Joneses, trying to keep everybody's home super nice and ornate. Meanwhile, my temple is still in shambles. So not only did you build your home first, but you're getting really fancy. Now's not the time to build my house, but apparently now's the time to get really fancy with yours. You boil it all down, they're guilty of what we can be guilty of. They're putting God's work aside so I can focus on my own life. I'll get to God, but you know, my family has this, and I'd rather do this, and the job needs this. And God says, you're doing it all backwards. You start with my work. You start with my community. You start with me, my desires, my church, time with me, and you live from there. Like, we say we're God's people, but is he actually in the picture of our lives? If you ever go to Berlin, this building will, will catch your eye. It's the Berlin State Museum, and it's got a very eclectic collection, you know, everything from, like, history, science, uh, art. And there's this one piece in the Berlin State Museum that, for whatever reason, it fascinates me. It's a painting from 1860 by an artist named Adolf Menzel. And he looks, definitely looks like the Scrooge, doesn't he? And this is Adolf. And somehow, Adolf he made this painting, and somehow it made it into the Berlin Museum. And it's not, to, it's not even that great of a painting because it's unfinished. So it's a 160-year-old painting. It's not even finished. Somehow it captivates me. The title of this painting is Frederick the Great Addresses His Generals. And if you look at it, you can see the generals. Do you notice who's missing? It's missing the king. The whole point of the painting, the title, is Frederick the Great. Frederick ain't so great in the picture because he's not even in it. Apparently what happened is Menzel started the painting by, you know, painting the generals and then the majestic horses and the detailed snowy ground. Menzel was planting on getting to the king, but then he died. And he left this rather ridiculous painting where the main subject, the title of the painting, isn't even in the painting. And it's silly, but I think it captivates me because some of our lives look just like that. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm God's people. It's all about God. Love Jesus. But the picture of my week last week, month last month, year last year, I don't see Jesus or God in any of that, really. Maybe a little. Like we're busy painting our careers and painting our hobbies and painting our kids' sports. It's like, I'll get to God. I'll get to time with him. I'll get to pressing more into him and getting more uncomfortable and, and pursuing God. Now's just not the time. And then we die and we leave these rather silly pieces, a life of following Jesus. And it's like, but where was Jesus? It's utterly fascinating what God says next. You might even feel this in your own life right now, but look at this, verse, the end of verse five. Hey, God continues, he says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. And then look at verse six, he says, 
You have sown much, you harvest little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one's warm. And he who earns wages does so, but then puts them in a bag with holes. It's like the ancient way of saying, you're doing a lot, but you're just spinning your wheels in the sand. You're you're out there building your own thing, trying to do life, trying to do marriage, trying to do parenting as best you know how, filling your calendar event to event, meeting to meeting, sport to sport, errand to errand. But look, you're spinning your wheels. You're going nowhere fast. And when your head hits the pillow some nights, you kind of feel it, don't you? It reminds me of uh, so a couple of falls ago, Nicole and I took the kids to, down to Louisiana, and we had like a, a late trip uh, late start to the trip. A meeting of mine went long. And so finally, we like, you know, we, we're pulling our camper. And finally, we get, the, we get out on the road, you know, pulling the camper down the interstate. And the goal was to get to the Kentucky border before, you know, sundown, the first night, and set up camp. And so we're literally racing the sun because as soon as the sun sets, it's just harder to set up camp, you know, in the dark. At sunset, we pull into the campground and it begins to downpour. It's like, yeah, perfect. You know, and sitting in the truck, I realize as I pull into the spot, you know, it's pouring, it's like getting dark. Like these spots don't even have water hookups. And the girls are going to want to shower tomorrow morning. So not only do I have to set up in the dark in the rain, I've got to go somewhere, find a water spigot, and fill up the camper with water so that the girls can shower. And so we pull out of the spot. We're driving around trying to find a, a spigot. And we're looking, we're looking, we're looking. Finally, Nicole says, found one. And she gets out of the truck, and she looks like, but it looks like one of those old school water pumps that you have to, you know, pump out of the well to get water. I was like, are you serious? Like, what kind of backwoods Kentucky are we? Like, we have to pump the water out? So I jump out of the truck, and Nicole and I are sitting there in the pouring rain. I told her, babe, could you just hold the hose into the, into the camper? I'll go, and I'll just, I'll pump the water to, to fill up the tank. So in the pouring rain, it's dark, raining hard, 10 minutes. I'm just sitting there pumping and pumping and pumping. And pumping. Out of breath, after 10 minutes, I'm like, how full are we? And she's like, hardly any. Like, what? I've been pumping for 10 minutes. There's no way there's no water coming out. She's like, well, it comes out for a little bit, but then it stops. Come to find out, it wasn't a pump. When you lift the lever, the water just rushes out. (laughs) When you press it down, you shut it off. I had been turning the water on and off for 10 minutes. Idiot gringo back out there again for 10 minutes. And to make it worse, my wife's hyperventilating, laying on the ground laughing. This is, this is the picture that God is painting. Like, you're working so hard, so hard, and you're powering through the rain, pumping water. You're waking up early. You're attacking the day. You're putting in extra hours. You're running your kid from sport to sport to sport to sport. You're knocking out the house project list, but you're, you're not getting much out of the hose, are you? You're not feeling like you're firing on all cylinders because you're doing it wrong. You sow a lot, you harvest little. All these hours into work, there's just not much to show for it. Full calendars, empty results. You're trying to have a fun marriage, but at the end of the day, you just kind of feel like it is a bit of a drag. Problems just kind of keep popping up, and it's just no fun. Same thing with the kids. You're trying to save. You're trying to aim your money, but you never really feel like you're financially firing on all cylinders. You're trying to live fresh, but you're struggling mentally. You don't feel like you're living intentionally. Like, we know the feeling. And according to Haggai, that's all symptoms that there's part of our lives or maybe our whole life is just being built out of order. And this is why he says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. It's time to think and rethink about what it looks like to follow Jesus holistically with your whole life. One lesson from a prophet with a hard to pronounce name. Here it is. God's house is main priority. God's house is main priority. And I know you're looking at this like, this is like an obvious point. Sure, I don't disagree with you, but like, is this really happening in your life? Like we say we're followers of Jesus, we say we have taken a hold of the gospel, that Jesus took our sin to the cross on our behalf, died, resurrected. That is like, defines us. But does it? Honestly? Is God's work and God's kingdom and God's people really your main focus, top priority? And I know we're all here right now, so it is a priority. I'm just asking, is it the priority? 
I was convicted about this a few years ago. I was driving by this location, actually. I had my girls in the back of the truck, and um, I was just making a joke. It was, it was a Sunday morning, and we'd driven past, because I wanted to park down the street. Um, and the girl's like, oh, Doug, you drove by the church. I was like, yeah, you know what? Well, we don't need church anymore. We're, just, we're not going to do this. Uh, it's a bad joke as a pastor, but made the joke. And the three girls in the back, they're like, no, Dad, ch- church is our world. I was like, okay, well, don't, I didn't say this, but I was thinking like, okay, don't be so dramatic. Then I, I was like, no, that's like, that's really good. And I'm so glad that they believe that. Like, no, the, the gathering of God's people, God's work, God's king, that's our world. Is it yours? Think about it this way. How we start something, whatever it is, however we start it is like incredibly important, isn't it? Like in the NFL, teams make it like a big deal to score on the opening drive because that sets the tone and it creates early momentum. Uh, Movie directors will invest huge amounts of money and energy into the opening scene of a movie because it sets the stage. The same thing with a first song in a concert or on on a record. Building a building, major part is, you know, planning the construction of the foundation because if you get a bad start, the building just crumbles. It is the same with our weeks. This is why God's people gather on the first day of the week. This is where we start, and then we go from here. How do you launch your week? Because that decision on the weekend to make church a priority or to do your own thing, that determines your week, and it determines your life. And I fear that all too often, again, I'm guilty of, I can be guilty of this, but we can view church like a lot of people view the gym. Hey, the gym's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing to have in my life. I'll get to it when I can, especially in January, you know, when I make those New Year's resolutions. I will get to it, you know, when we're feeling guilty of missing too many workouts or ah, I had a rough weekend, feeling bloated, so I should probably get in and work it off. But most don't build the gym into their routines. And if we do, it's like if I go, okay, it's in and out. Like I, I just don't want to be noticed. You know, I don't want to be one of those meatheads with the whole gallon of, like the milk gallon of water. I don't know what's up with that. The guy's carrying around like gallons of water But, you know, I don't want to be one of those guys, you know, so just kind of in and out, and uh, I'll see you next week, you know, maybe. Many churchgoers, they view the church that way. It's like, all right, church is a good thing for my life. Uh, I don't need to be a meathead about it. I'll go when I feel guilty of missing for too long, or if I had a really bad week, kind of feel like I got into a lot of sin, I'll probably try to get in here and purge myself a little bit. And when I go into church, it's just kind of in and out, not really invested. I'm not going to make this a priority, so let's not go overboard. And I think that that thinking is understandable, but Haggai here is calling us to the mat because it's either full in living in God's community or you're not. There's no both. You're living your life aimed at God or yourself. There's no both. Now, in our sin, we try to do both. And here we see God just doesn't put up with that. Is the community of God's people and God's kingdom, is that your people? Are you faithful to the gathering or can you take it or leave it? I get the difficulty in that. I really do. Anytime Nicole and I, when we like take the girls out of town or whatever, I'm, this is so bad, but like I'm so tempted to skip church. Especially if like we're camping, you know, it's like waking up on a Sunday morning. It's like, ah, I don't want to find a church and drive there. I'd rather read. I'd rather fish. And visiting a church is like, it can be the worst, right? It can be awkward. Like those of you who are visiting the bridge with us, Props to you, because I, I get it. It can just be weird to visit churches. Uh, you, know, you, you go in, most churches you walk in, you don't know where to go. And then, you know, if you have kids, you're like, you got to drop your kids off. And so, a lot of times, like with some angry looking church lady who says she'll take your kids, you're like, ah, I feel bad dropping you guys off with like Nanny McPhee right here. You know, so you send them off, your kids off with this, this lady, and you don't know if what's going to happen. And then, this, by the way, this is why we have our best looking people doing bridge kids. But then, you know, you get to the auditorium, you sit down, you're like, okay, I've made it to the auditorium. I don't know where I'm at, but I'm in the auditorium. And then the pastor gets up, he's like, hey, greet somebody around you. And you're like, yeah, crap. I don't want to meet any of these people around me. Like, they seem nice, but like forced greeting is like small talk, how's the weather? I don't want to, d- I'm here to do church. I don't need forced greeting time. Like, you know, and half the time I go to a church, people ask if I need assistance. And so, so... I'll tell you, as much as I want to skip skip church sometimes, my family, we power through that awkwardness. Nicole and I had this conversation just a couple weeks ago. We we were out of town, and I told her, I was like, babe, we we have to go. I'm sorry, but we have to go. 
and it's going to be awkward, I know, and it's inconvenient, I know, but we do it because we want our girls to know the church is their world. I don't want them to lose that. I want them to know the church is a pillar for their life. Yeah, it can be weird. It can be awkward. You can have the scary Nanny McPhee church lady here and there. But for the most part, church people are great people. They're just great people. And whether they're great or not, they're our people. So it's not an option. In our home, we don't wake up on the weekend going, are we going to church? It's never a question in our house. That's never asked. Instead, it's when are we going to church and who's serving where? Because we live from our community. Our faith is very communal. And we've lost that a little bit. I'm not saying us specifically, but in general, I think we can all admit we've lost that in our society, haven't we? Like it wasn't long ago that Christians just outright refused to do business or to engage in sports on a Sunday. Chariots of Fire, right? Big movie. That was an example of that. You ever see that movie? Like Eric Liddell refused to run on a Sunday. It's God's day. I'm not going to run. But this conviction in, West, in, in Christian Christian, Western Christianity, it's just waning. And, and I fear that, a fear of what we're communicating to the next generation. It's like, yeah, God's community, it's just take it or leave it. But it's a nice thing to have. It's like a gym. And God says, no, no, no. It's the first thing. It's the centerpiece of your life. Or it's nothing. Now let me add a caveat to this. This is so big, and I, I really do think that this can adjust some of our thinking when it comes to priorities in life. At first, this point was God's house comes first, which it does. That comes from Scripture. Problem with that is is we can often misapply what that means. Like, for example, for a lot lot of times, you know, people, you know, they have, like, their Instagram bios or they go and they have, like, their online dating profiles and they'll list their priorities in their bios, right? Like, one, two, three, four. And I'm not down on this, but, like, a lot of people do this. People put, like, you know, uh, number one, God first and family and then friends and then work. And then if you're a girl, you know, some some girls like, oh, pumpkin lattes is number five or something like that. Um, but you've seen this, right? And I'm not down on this, but you, you, you know, you, you've seen this, or maybe you do it, and it's great. List of priorities. God first. Sounds great. That's awesome. That's like a great heart. And then family. Get it. Totally. Problem is, is this doesn't, this doesn't really translate to reality. This doesn't work. Like family comes before work. How? So on average, I work, I don't know, 55 hours a week. I don't spend 55 hours a week in quiet time with God. So does that mean my work comes before God? And I don't spend 55 hours a week with my family. So does that mean that work comes before family? Does that mean like if you have a full-time job, you're basically an idolater? I knew a guy. This has actually happened. It was so funny. He got married and, uh, you know, it was like the newlywed, like, honeymoon stage. And the wife always wanted him around and couldn't stand when he'd go to work. And when he would leave for work, she would say, like, no, honey, don't I come first? I'm your wife. And he was like, I mean, that's true. So he didn't go into work for like a few weeks. After a few weeks, he got canned. He got fired. What an idiot. But to his defense, he was trying to follow the priority list, right? This mentality. He's like, "Ah, well, yeah, family comes before work. It's like, no, come on, that's stupid. Life's not a list. And for those of us who are list people, I know that hurts to hear, but no, life's not a list. So just kind of go with me here for a second. Life priorities aren't lists to check off. Because life is always ebbing and flowing and changing, right? Certain seasons need different focuses on others. Instead of a list, think of your priorities as a wheel. We'll call this our wheel of life. So this is your life. This is my life. And each spoke on the wheel is an area of your life. Family, work, friends, hobbies. And as life goes, the wheel turns. So you go into this busy season at work and the wheel turns. And now the, the work priority is top of the list because it needs your full attention. And it needs you to put in overtime. Um, it's just a season, but it really needs a lot of your focus. And so you're working long, long hours. But then something happens in the family. And so the wheel moves now. And, and now your family is at the top of the list. Maybe it's summer and the kids are home. So you're trying to step back a little bit from work and invest more in, in your children. Or maybe a parent's health is failing. And so you're pumping more attention into your family. But at some point, you find yourself tired. It's like, man, long hours at work and family issues. I need to recharge. And so you're like, I'm going to just take a weekend away with some guys or some girls, and we're going to go enjoy a hobby together. And that's a good thing to do. But then the week you come back from your hobby, it's like a friend is going through a crisis, and they need your support. And so the wheel turns again. Life is not a list. It's a wheel. 
And the message that God is telling us through Haggai is you're leaving out the center of the wheel. God is saying, I'm the center of the wheel. You live all of these areas of your life from me. I hold it all together. I just learned this yes, uh, today, actually. I was walking with a, I just got into uh, mountain biking or like fat tire biking, a blast. I got one like last week and I found a few guys in our church who do it as well. And so having a lot of fun. And I, I was up at camp with one of the guys who does the, the biking and he was telling me that a spokes on a wheel, that the center of the wheel actually pulls the wheel in. It doesn't push the wheel out, but it pulls the, the rim in. I love that thought. Like he was telling me, this is like, dang, I got to remember this for, for tonight, that you have God just pulling everything in. Without the center of the wheel, you can't ride a bike without the center of the wheel. It just falls apart. But that's some of our lives. It's like, man, great looking spokes. You got a great career, beautiful family. But you're not going anywhere. You're just spinning your wheels because you don't have the center of your wheel. See, not only is this a biblical concept, it just makes sense. Your priorities won't compete with each other if God is at the center. They just won't because God is pulling everything toward him and there's no competition in that. God has to be at the center. Each area of your life is built off of him. This is the main message of Haggai. See, God designed, I love the, the history, really the history of Jerusalem. God designed Jerusalem to operate with the presence of God being central. All of what would happen in Jerusalem would, would flow from um, the presence of God. So Jerusalem's business, families, homes, marketplace, construction, it, it just all centered and, f- and flowed from the presence of God in the city. God's design of Jerusalem just is awesome. Jerusalem was intended to be a city unlike any other. It was a city of rare unity, lots of celebrations, and it all centered around the presence of God within the city. It was a city that other cities would look at and they would say, it's a peculiar city. Our city's not like that. It's very peculiar, but it's beautiful. Beautiful. People would say, you have to visit Jerusalem. It's unlike anything. I can't even explain it. But everyone in Jerusalem, in Haggai, is so stressed about trying to get their homes in order, open their businesses, do their construction, so worked up trying to accomplish their task list that as they rebuild this amazing city, in their stress, all they're doing is building a city just like, the, just like their neighboring cities. And it's our story, too. You were designed just like Jerusalem. Jerusalem the presence of God in you, the Holy Spirit in you, and you build your, the different areas of your life off him. But here we are working so hard, building our nice homes, beautiful families, and we're just building it like that of our neighbors. And it becomes just this useless pile of rebar because God is really not the centerpiece of each area of your life, of your passion and your schedules. We sow much and harvest little. We drink much, never satisfied. Working hard with little to show because the centerpiece of our life just isn't there. And thankfully in Haggai, the people of Jerusalem heard God's message loud and clear. And in verse 12, if you have your Bibles in front of you, verse 12, they pivot. They pause their house projects. They delay their opening of their business. They postpone some of their construction. And the people aim their time and their resources and their passion at the center of the, of the wheel. Let's rebuild God's house, the centerpiece of our community, of our lives. Let's focus on that. Let's get to serving. Let's get that going again. Let's get this right. And then let's build. And I think we do well to do the same. And that might look like drastic changes to our lives. That might look like revamping our calendars. But if God is who we believe him to be, he has to be the focal point of every part of our life. I'll finish with this. There's a verse that, for some reason, I have not been able to shake lately. It's been like a month that just this verse keeps on popping into my, my head. And uh, maybe it's for the sermon. Maybe God just wants it shared with this community. Maybe it's because I've been building the wrong thing myself. But I have not been able to, to shake this verse. But I hope this verse sticks with you into this next week. It's, it's actually 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says, but on judgment day, this is a day that's going to happen, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. 
the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. You're that builder, building your career, as you should, building a business, building a home, building a family, and we are to make them great. But the order in which we do it, that matters. Some of us will spend our entire lives building piles of hay that will burn right up. A life that mattered very little for eternity, suffered great loss. But may we be the people in verse 15, connecting everything we do to God because he gives direction, he gives meaning, he gives power, and we need that. Any part of our lives disconnected from him is useless and it will burn up. See, whether we like it or not, the day is coming. Judgment day is real. Fire will test us. And the portions of our lives that just didn't matter, all the useless rebar, there'll be nothing left. And so as we build, let's build right. We start here, doing this, in God's word, worshiping, serving, We live from this. And let's make our calendars and our commitments and our passion reflect the center of our lives. God, we thank you so much for Haggai. We thank you for Haggai recording this part of Israel's history. And Father, may we be not just hearers of your word, but doers. Because at some level, all of us find ourselves like the people in Jerusalem. Some of us are building with hay that will not stand the test of the fire that will come. And so, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, may you convict, and may we be sensitive to that conviction, especially this week, as we get back to our lives building as we should. May we make sure that we have the right priorities. And even as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I just want to ask you, it's our so what question for tonight. What's it going to take to put God at the center of your life, more at the center of your life this week? Maybe that looks like revamping the calendar, and maybe that looks like reconsidering some commitments or some activities. Maybe that looks like what we talked about and what's happening with signing up for serving. Maybe that looks like a family conversation of, hey, we need to make the gathering of God's people a staple. It's not a question anymore. We're just going to be there every weekend. But what's it going to take this week to move God more at the center of your life and what you're building? Father, you are so far better than anything this world can offer. As the psalmist writes, there is nothing, this world has nothing I desire but you. Father, may our lives reflect that this week. May you guide us because we need that. May you convict us because we need that. And may we find priorities. May we build priorities that honor you. We thank you for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name.